everyone, and a massive welcome to the next episode here on InfoSec Live of How to Hire Cyber Talent, where we get to engage with and learn from the cybersecurity industry's leadership in a live setting with open and honest conversations. And for those that are new to the channel, my name's Simon Instead, and I'm the founder of the InfoSec Live community and also your host for this show today. And by sharing best stories, sorry, and best practice, it's been a long day, I'll come to that later, over the last few months has led to nearly 6,000 hours of our content being viewed on YouTube by over 2,300 of you amazing subscribers. So a huge thank you for your engagement. And if you'd like to support the wider InfoSec Live community, or indeed just buy me a decaf coffee, we do have a few ways you can show your appreciation. The ability to purchase super stickers in the YouTube chat if you'd like your question bumped up to the top and three tiers of membership allowing you to show your support in any way that you can. But whether you join or not, being here and engaging with our content is what really matters. So if you're watching this live, please do like and subscribe. We want to make these events as interactive as possible. So make sure you also drop any questions you may have in the chat. After all, it's you, our audience, who make these events so special. And we're going to be digging deep today into the issues around hiring practices. And I'm very, very excited to be joined today by someone I've had on the show before, an amazing guy, Patrick Gillespie. And Patrick has 18 years experience as an information technology and security leader. And as CEO and founder of Boots to Cyber, he leads a world-class team of veterans with decades of experience serving their country. The Boots to Cyber leadership team works to lower veteran unemployment by building cybersecurity careers in which veterans will thrive whilst filling the cyber shortage. And Patrick at the moment is an Operation Enduring Freedom veteran, served as an intelligence analyst, completed his master's degree in CIS security at Boston University, and some of his Amazing collection of certifications include OSCP, CISSP, CCNP, CCNA, CCSA, and Pentest Plus. And he's mentored dozens of veterans to enter the cybersecurity field. He serves on the board of advisors for the 501c nonprofit Boots to Books. Boots to Books helps veterans attain competitive education and employment opportunities and has helped over 3,000 veterans and provided over $50,000 in resources and helped veterans free of charge to get hired at some of our nation's top technology companies. And that was founded by the amazing individual who I had the pleasure of meeting in San Francisco this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, Peter Klein. Peter, if you're watching, I salute you, sir. It's an absolutely amazing job. Now, I think you'll agree this is going to be epic. Simon, stop rambling on. Let's bring him on. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Sam. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Tired, but good. So I'm not yeah. going to stand here and moan about what I've been doing all week. What I want to hear about today is, well, firstly, a little bit of background about how you got into the industry. And then I want to move on to the amazing work that you're doing with Boots to Cyber as well. So let's start off with, with your journey, Patrick, for those that don't know you. All right. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, the, the intro was pretty epic. Not sure how the rest of my stuff will go compared to that. So <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll, I'll give it my best shot. So um yeah so i got into it back in 2005 so nearly 18 years ago where i essentially we just started building servers so it was a very much a growing field at the time um so i spent a couple years doing uh, more server support system administration work i um was also in the military at the time i did a deployment to afghanistan i did more intel work there but also did networking and it just because of my civilian background and then got it really got heavy into network administration, the Cisco, all the Cisco letters and certs and all that fun stuff. Um, and then while I was doing a lot of infrastructure, you know, firewall management, really protecting a business I was working for is when I went and got my master's degree in cybersecurity. So that's really what got me started in security back in 2010. And then 2016, I got my first job as a pen tester doing uh as a consultant doing client work. Um, so I did that job for, um, you know, probably over five years uh, where I ended up leading the network penetration team there and then help help build a red team. And then we also, um, you know, my last couple of years have been more leadership than technical. So this this past year, I've been at uh, GuidePoint Security, uh, manage a, a team there. And then also I'm with a team of three other veterans. Uh, we are building Boost to Cyber. So like you mentioned before, you know, and people have already asked. So it is often very difficult to um, get into cybersecurity. You know, sadly, it's often who you know, not what you know, despite all of the cyber jobs they say that are open, all the, you know, the needs that people have, um, you know, like everybody needs cybersecurity and there's not enough trained people to do it. However, 
why is it still so hard for people that are getting all these certs or all these degrees to get these jobs? Well, it's, um, it's really funny you mentioned that. I think that was that was one of the first comments we had in the chat even before we yeah. went live about the importance of people being able to hear from leaders as to what they can do because you've got all these people out there who've followed the noise of the boot camps or followed the noise of social media to collect all these certifications and then they're left high and dry when it comes to getting work. What, what can they do differently, Patrick? So there's, so you're attacking two problems, Simon. So to get a job, you need to fix two issues. The first is getting an interview, and the second is getting the job offer. So most candidates that are wanting to get into cybersecurity focus on certs and education and labs and training and exploits, and these are great things. These will help you get the job offer, but however, people are applying for hundreds of jobs regularly and not getting one phone call. So getting the interview nowadays is much harder than getting the job offer. Once you get interviews, you're more, more than likely, if you're doing all of that, you're going to get an offer eventually. But the, the hang up right now is why can't we get interviews, especially for entry level positions? Well, the a short answer may be is hiring managers like me make it difficult. So yeah. the the process now is if I post a entry level position on LinkedIn, I'm going to get a thousand people in a couple of days. Right. It's very difficult, very time consuming to narrow that down. So if, if you are in a pool of a thousand people and you all have the same CompTIA certs, you yeah. have the same bachelor's degree from different colleges, you have, you know, some help desk experience, you have, you know, system administration, even if you have IT, it's very hard for a hiring manager to compare and differentiate people. So you really got to stand out among the crowd because post COVID you're competing against the world for these remote jobs. Yeah. You know, the competition is a lot higher than it used to be. So, to help you stand out, you know, you got to be doing those things above and beyond. So some people say you have to have a degree or you have to have security plus or pen test plus, whatever. Those things are great. They will help you get the job offer. However, most of the time, they're not going to help you get the interview um, because the jobs you see on Indeed and LinkedIn and all these job sourcing places, that's only 25 to 30 percent of the jobs that get filled. So. So where are all these other jobs? Well, it's hiring managers like me who know people or who have worked with people or trained people as a mentor. We're hiring them because we don't have to go through a thousand resumes. We don't have to sit through a hundred phone interviews and 20 Zoom interviews. And, and, and more to the point, Patrick, you already know these people, right? You know what right. makes them tick. You know what they've done. Yeah. So to target, you know, it's so don't give up applying for jobs that that's still Thousands, millions of jobs get filled every year through LinkedIn, through these 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 sources. So so don't give that up, but don't put all your eggs in that basket because you're not even targeting the majority of the jobs that are open. So how do you target these other jobs? Well, that's where networking comes into play. So um, what's um, so let's say you wanted to, Simon, what's a uh, company close to you that that hires cyber people like to, to oh, well, I'll, I'll name drop one. I'll name drop one. I've just got to remember the name. I've just got to remember the name. Cyberscale. There we go. Cyberscale on my local cybersecurity firm. Name drop Darren Chapman. Hope you're pleased. All right. Cyberscale. Yeah, we that's a good high five on that one. So yeah, Cyberscale. Same. So if I want if I'm in London and I want to work for Cyberscale, so how would I network with people there? Um, if you're local, you know, it's still it's good to meet, you know, for coffee, breakfast, like you know, Simon said, buy him a decaf coffee. Yeah. Um, but you want to start with LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has a ton of people that you want to connect with, right? So you can get on LinkedIn. You're going to find CyberScale on LinkedIn, the company. Then you're going to go click on the link at the top that says view all these em hundreds of employees or however many is at CyberScale. And then you're going to try to find something that connects you with one of them. Maybe yeah. you sort by the college you went to and maybe you get a hit or two on people that went to the same college that yeah, worked there. Dare I, dare I say this could also be practice for your social engineering skills. <laughs> that is correct. So once you, yeah, once you're doing this, yeah, you can pretend to be anybody you want to be that's on LinkedIn <laughs> because that is public information. Yeah. So yeah. Use all this information. Yeah. It, information is great and it, but it's great for enemies too. So 
yeah. you got to be be careful on what you put out there. So so reach out to people, find something that connects. So like in our, you know, or like in um, if you have somebody that's in the, the, you know, the British Army, you know, you can sort by past company and find people that served in the army, you know, and then or even all the branches that are there. I don't, I'm not very familiar with the branches you have there. Um, but now you're targeting veterans that served and that work at the place you want to work at, that has jobs you want to work at. So they're more likely to connect with you and respond to questions. So you want to really, so it's just, this is marketing yourself. Just yeah. like it's building people. rapport, yeah. isn't it, Patrick? You're building rapport with people with the common interest. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, so that's how, that's how networking works. It's, I know it sounds simple, um, but I've hired eight vets in the last two years. You know, it's just through, you know, being, I'm putting myself out there as a mentor, met with dozens of veterans, helped them get a lot of jobs at other places. And that's where Boost to Cyber comes into play. Um, so, yeah, so, so definitely target, you know, companies you're seeing job postings at, you know, network with. It doesn't have to be people in that department. If you get a somebody on the inside, whether that's in sales or recruiting or HR or wherever, um, you can, you know, get that inside person to say, to talk to the hiring manager says, hey, I know this person that can do this. And they may not even have to do a job posting because that's, again, that's the much easier for hiring managers is to go that route compared to sorting through hundreds or thousands of. of and, then, and, let's, and let's not forget most or if not most, some organizations will pay up to a 5% finders fee for people who work within the organization. So it's, oh, yeah. it's, within, it's within your own best interests if you've got some talent, you know, outside the organization to lift your head up and mention it as well, Patrick. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, a lot of employees have or employers have those those programs to bring in good talent because they're more likely to stay in the company and, you know, fit into the culture better and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of good benefits for, for doing this and also to help other people get into the industry. Um, so with uh, Boost to Cyber, what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to fill a couple of voids here. So veteran unemployment is high. Um, and veterans are great candidates for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity are, is oftentimes a very stressful environment, you know, especially if you're doing incident response, digital forensics, those sorts of jobs, or SOC, yeah. even SOC analysts, you know, you're, you're always on guard. You're always watching and protecting and defending, and this is something that veterans have been trained to do and have done for a long time. Um, so we can – so what we're trying to do is build, build that bridge really – I don't know if apprenticeship is the top, the right word, you know, so we've partnered with whole cyber human initiative to, they're a nonprofit that provides a, you know, a hundred hour course for anybody. And I saw Liam. Well, I was just going to say, Liam's just mentioned up there. Is it just yeah. for vets? Now, now boots to cyber is just for vets, but the whole cyber human initiative, like you said, Patrick is for everyone, isn't it? I'll find the link while you tell him a bit about it. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll help anybody we can be our, our, second piece is to try to create jobs for veterans essentially in the military community military spouses and dependents so because when you transition out of the military you lose your job and you move your family right so those are two of the top five highest stressful things you can do in life yeah. so so you anybody can go to whole cyber human initiative that simon just posted and do their one hour 100 hour training program essentially um, and then they will help you, you know, find positions. And like I said, and it, and it may be a position with us. Uh, we do contract contract roles. You know, we don't limit it to just veterans, especially for contract roles, um, just because oftentimes those are very specific on the needs. And sometimes yeah. we have to hire a non-veteran for, for those roles. Um, but our um, program is your, your, your primary program is to use veterans where, where you can but obviously yes. sometimes you can't yeah no yeah, I, it's as many as we can. yeah for, let me, let me veterans, just come back i want to just draw back to a comment rebecca made in the chat because it does hit quite close to home she said that a side perk of building a professional network is that it makes you become more professional i'll bring it up here we go makes you become more professional if you were once a degenerate like myself it really works <laughs> have a drug problem befriend the dea now rebecca i'm also an ex-degenerate so i'm feeling your message and also that 
I suppose if you've had a checkered past, again, just going off on a tangent a little bit, how good it makes you feel helping other people and actually giving back for once rather than taking and thinking about yourself. I mean, it's changed my life the last couple of years. And I know, you know, for you, Patrick, the last two or three years in, in leadership positions, I expect this changed your life as well. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's changed my whole career focus. I was on the path to becoming a CISO, had mentors, wanted to, you know, be an executive, help run a business, help train and lead, you know, IT and security departments. However, I realized that that's not, that was not the path that I wanted to go after meeting with some mentors. And so mentoring veterans really has completely transitioned my career focus, my uh, mentality for helping people. You know, I, my mental health is better. My family is better. Um, you know, I did take a pay cut to do what I'm doing um, and that's fine. Well, that, there, yeah. we, there we go. There's my other point, right? Money is an amplifier. It doesn't bring happiness, does it? Oh, you yeah. Know, we, we all need enough money to pay the bills, but I'm I'm probably earning less now than I have for about 25 <laughs> years. But every day I wake up with a smile on my face and I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing, which is which is hugely oh, yeah. important. And I see um, Mr. Paul Cummings, the founder of Whole Cyber Human Initiative in the chat here, and he's brought up a, a very good point saying that all veterans who served a minimum of seven years are already program managers, mentors, and continuous learners, and so much more. And for me, one of the biggest things you hear from CISOs on the CISO experience, talking about their frustrations with hiring, is the lack of critical thinking out there. And dependent upon your role in the military, I would argue that there's a better chance of someone who's served in the military having some decent critical thinking than someone who hasn't. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And oftentimes veterans, don't have those professional networks. They'll come out with LinkedIn with 20 connections. So they're not, you know, they don't know how to start building that network or, and, you know, oftentimes that's hard to do. You know, they just start applying for jobs or doing all these certs. And there's a ton of great free resources now that were not available when I got out a long time ago. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's another great point. The soft skills equation really, you know, really factors in that, you know, vets are, oftentimes extremely successful in IT and cybersecurity and, you know, project management, like, uh, like Paul mentioned. Um, well, the, the, other, the other thing that, uh, that there seems to me, you know, we're talking about entry level a lot and mm -hmm. hiring cyber talent at that end, which, which is great, but the other ends a mess as well. And, and for different reasons. So you look at the CISO market and the leadership market, you simply haven't got enough people out there now for the demand to do the job. So again, people, transitioning from not just from the military but different careers where they've got you know a decade or more of leadership experience again from my humble opinion i think that can be brought across and translated into the cyber world as well yeah for sure and oftentimes businesses are short-term focused when it comes to cybersecurity. so instead of creating a program to bring in anybody vets or not to train and grow and learn the industry, they're stealing talent from somebody else and just paying them more. That way they get their short-term needs met, but they're not thinking long-term and building out their own program. So that's what we're trying to do is really build out the apprenticeship, apprenticeship program to where you know our candidates have gone through whole cyber human initiative and we're able to identify their strengths, their weaknesses, you know, room for improvement, what and what area there's a ton of roles in cybersecurity, so there's dozens of them so you know one area you may be great in and another area you may hate but if you go get a job that you hate even if it's for a lot of money you know usually when you get a raise after about the second paycheck usually you're wanting more money yeah. so if uh if you're chasing money you're always going to be chasing that so i, I completely um, agree and do, do you know what i'll tell you a i'll tell you a story without naming names I wasn't employed, but I was doing some contract work for a firm recently and I felt so undervalued by them that I left without a job to go to. And that's with having six kids to feed, which is probably a crazy decision. But going back to what you said earlier, it's about your mental health as well. Right. And, if, and if you're waking up every day and doing something that you don't feel you're being valued for, you've got you know little interest in because of that, it's soul destroying, right? And again, sure. it's, it's not all about the money. Money doesn't bring happiness. It, it, brings nice warm heated seats in your car and you know food on the table when you need it but there, there is a limit to what you need i think patrick yeah for sure so what we're trying to do is we're really trying to target small businesses that currently don't 
have really any cybersecurity other than maybe an antivirus that's installed with Microsoft or something. Um, because oftentimes when larger enterprises, when you start dealing with compliance, you got to have separate entities to do yeah. like independent audits or independent external pen tests or risk assessments. So for small businesses, that's cost prohibited or the cost is prohibitive of really doing anything in cyber. So we're going to come in and have essentially a squad. Essentially, it's security in a box. For less than paying for one full-time employee, you'll be able to have a team, a squad essentially, of red team, blue team, you know, project manager, you know, those sorts of things to keep cybersecurity included in all of your business processes instead of just doing an annual pen test. So, you know, paying a, a monthly fee to essentially have, you know, vets or not, you know, military spouses, whoever, uh, be on this squad to um, really protect your business, get to know your business. You know, they'll be able to work for multiple clients. Um, but what we'll do is, you know, once they get through whole cyber, you know, in the training programs and, you know, they may have certs, um, you know, and oftentimes degrees are starting to kind of slowly fade away, thankfully, for as a requirement to have a four year degree, because it's not like Simon said, you know, if, once you, if you get out of the military or if you leave your job without another one, you can't go get a four year degree and live no. for four years. You know, that that may not help you with your um, your goals. You know, the timing has a lot to do with, you know, whether you want a degree. Now, if you want to go get a degree, it's your lifetime dream. Go do it for sure. I'm not I have I've been to eight colleges. I'm not knocking education at all. Um, so I'm a big proponent of education. But however, it may not be financially or you know, fit into your time goals. So just, just consider that. So we're not, you know, requiring degrees. We're not requiring certifications. You know, big thing is you, you love what you do and you get through these, you know, this whole cyber program essentially is very holistic. Um, and then we're able to, as we grow our business, we're planning on launching marketing and, you know, business development next year, next month, really, that's about three weeks. So, um, to really start really soft launch and then grow from there to, as we get clients, then fit in people, you know, whether it's part-time, full-time, and as we grow, um, to, to do on the job training, essentially learn how to protect these small businesses, these school systems, these, you know, universities, um, so many, so many areas that, that need protection, but often can't afford it. Do you know, do you know um, what, Patrick, I think you've hit on probably, in my opinion, the biggest growth area over the next five years in cybersecurity, which is the SMB sector. And from my own experience, the last nine months talking to SMBs about cyber, there's two things that are glaringly obvious. One, a lack of understanding of what they actually need to do. You mentioned it earlier, you know, we need a pen test. Why do you need a pen test? Well, because our insurance company told us, or, you know, our regulators are telling us we should. And it's so much more than a pen test. And I've gone down the line with a few of these firms to look at, you know, connecting them up with different people for different services. So incident response, GRC, and you're talking, you know, if you're using the companies out there in the marketplace at the moment, anywhere between 10 and 25,000 pounds a month, to have these services. Well, I'm telling you now, a small business who's never done anything about security with a global recession upon us are never going to be able to afford those fees. So again, also, I suppose, laboring on the point of hiring practices and the fees that recruitment consultants charge, that's a big problem, I think, in the industry as well, which again, is a, is a cost barrier to entry for a lot of these firms. Who's got, you know, 15 20 25 30 percent of someone's salary if you're a smaller business to recruit someone and and equally like you said you can't recruit six six or well, one person to do six people's jobs and again that's what you're seeing with smaller businesses they're trying to take on one person and that's why i think you see in a lot of the job descriptions you know CISO required with a in-depth knowledge of python <laughs> <laughs> yeah you really don't want a CISO writing script no. or editing <laughs> editing editing code so that's yeah, that's a disaster in the making anyway. So, yeah, um, so yeah, so being able to take advantage of a small company like ours for small businesses is, you know, oftentimes they don't have those regulators. So if they don't have to have independent audits, we can come in and be their red team. We'll find the issues. We'll be their blue team. We'll fix the issues. And then together as purple team, we'll validate the issues were fixed. So now instead of getting a pen test report that costs 
10, $20,000. Don't know how that compares to pounds. You yeah. get we're, nearly, we're nearly at parity, Patrick, I think. So pretty much the same at well, the moment. Uh, yeah, you can, you can yeah. come here on holiday now and get a big bang for your buck. Yeah, it's better than that FTX Bitcoin stuff. So no, it's Ooh, good. Sorry, yeah, guys, I, I sold out my, my modest holding in Bitcoin. I sold out far too early. I sold mm. out about 15 months ago because I thought the mm. markets were going down. And I've always said I'm not going to buy back in until it gets down to 10,000. Then I'll put a big chunk of my pension in. Yeah. And maybe hopefully that works out. <laughs> hopefully it might not, but I'll only put in what I can afford to lose. Not like loads of people in the last three or four years who've punted in their life savings. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it may be too soon for the FTX reference. So my bad. Yeah, it might, might be. Yeah. Sorry about that. Folks. <laughs> so, yeah. So instead of paying for it. So, again, a lot of cybersecurity companies, they'll, they'll charge you for a pen test, which shows you your weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So now you got to go find a separate company or your IT department, if you have one, and if you have a one-man IT shop, they're not going to know or have time to do all these security projects. You know, they're constantly keeping your business running. So IT is about uptime, keeping things running efficiently, keeping your business running using technology, you know, making sure your website stays up, your your CRM, your bit, your ERP system, all, you know, whatever resource you use to, to manage your your accounting and your your projects and task management and all these sorts of things. So that's what IT is about is keeping your business running 24 seven. And then cybersecurity, we come in and we, you know, we're not replacing your IT person. We're not replacing your IT company. We're making sure that the things your IT person puts in place has been secured, has been hardened to protect from an attacker. Um, so, so let me let me just jump in because you, you're probably going to tell me yes, that's exactly what we're doing, Simon. But for me, a massively fast route to market to you would be the smaller MSPs who are looking after these businesses. And the yeah. problem, the problem a lot of those have at the moment, from the from the few that I've spoken to, is that they're desperate to provide a service to their clients. When they reach out to other businesses, it just makes them look stupid because of how much it costs. You know, right. they're not prepared to put them across. So I, I would have thought that there's a there's a lot to be said for spending some time developing relationships with the MSPs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially because, again, there's are there's and there are a few MSPs that try to be MSSPs, but it is yeah. to have your staff be IT focused with all that entails, which is a huge umbrella. And then to also be cybersecurity focused, there's new things come out every day for both sides. You like you mentioned, you, you know, you can't have your CISO writing code, you know, or doing the vulnerability analysis or because you're just going to burn them out. That's, you know, burnout is, is crazy high as well. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, you know, people feel protected if they have a firewall. Right. And you have, you know, say, well, it'll it'll keep hackers out. Well, until somebody clicks a link on an email and lets Simon into your network, you know. But, well, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> We know you're attacking everybody, Simon. No, yeah, I try. Yeah. <laughs> One day. One if Bitcoin day. doesn't work out for you. Uh, sorry. Let me get there. <laughs> there goes the coffee. Right, I digress. Sorry. Sorry, Simon. Um, I know it's late for you now. So you're probably no, 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 not, not at all. You say it's late. It's, it's half past eight here. I've got a 17-year-old son mm. who's doing a shift at KFC until 11 nice. o'clock tonight so i'll be picking up him in a bucket of chicken at about 11 my time so i'm not in any rush at all patrick no, thank no, you for thinking of me yeah that's great no that's good time so so if we can come in and so now a cfo or your your cpa if you don't have a, a you know chief financial officer for these small businesses you'll know per month what you're going to pay based on the number of users you have so essentially you'll be paying per user per month and you get this squad, you know, you'll, you'll get endpoint detection, managed network detection. You'll get, to, you know, multi-factor, you know, with duo. You'll get, you know, zero trust segmentation if you if you need that, especially if you're in like a manufacturing environment um, or, you know, PCI or if you take credit cards like a lot of small businesses. Yeah, do. I mean, again, you, you're now, you're now, I suppose, reinforcing the value of your service because each one of these businesses you've just mentioned will have a completely different um, I suppose, requirement for what they need to protect and what they need to spend yeah. money on. And the needs of each CEO, you know, what they're concerned about is going to be different. 
right? So, you know, a school superintendent compared to a, you know, pharmacist at a pharmacy or, um, you know, the people at the local retail stores, you know, the data they have and the information they're trying to protect is going to be different. So, so these oftentimes cybersecurity companies, like you said, or MSSPs will provide a huge quote that's kind of like checkboxed, you know, yeah. you want external pen test, internal pen test, you know, but without really understanding what the concerns are of the business owner yeah, um, or the stakeholders in the environment. So if, if we can really pinpoint that down, because now we can cut out all that other mess you don't need. Um, again, it's great. If you could do all of that every day would be fantastic. If you had somebody pen testing your network every day, you know, doing updates every day, but you, small businesses cannot afford that. You cannot afford a team to do that every day. So you can't, and you can't shut down the business in order to be secure, or then there's no business to exist. So you have to balance, you know, your, the cost you're going to spend on cybersecurity with what you're wanting to protect. You start with your critical data first, you segment that off, you know, require multi-factor authentication, make sure it's encrypted in motion at rest in the cloud, if you have cloud environments. Um, so really understanding that and setting priorities because you can't do everything all at once. You don't have the time, you don't have the resources, you don't have the money. So really, you know, with each squad getting to know your business and multiple clients, you know, we come at it from a, a whole cyber perspective, just like what Paul is doing at Whole Cyber Human Initiative is to, um, yeah, just like what Paul mentioned for hospitals, because uh, hospitals deal with HIPAA compliance. So a lot yeah. of, you know, health concerns there, um, or health data, sorry, to be exact. Um, so, yeah, so that's really what we're kind of trying to fix both sides um, from a from a small business perspective or school perspective, um, while also, you know, training these veterans that are transitioning from the military. Because if we can build a long-term program and have a pipeline coming through, then, you know, in five years, we can fill those CISO spots or we can fill those, you know, security infrastructure architect positions or, you know, but it, we have to start somewhere. If somebody's not looking five years down the road and they're, if, and if I was trying to fill a spot today, I'm just going to go, you know, pay Simon jobs in cyber to fill a spot. If, if all I'm concerned about is this next year, then I'm just going to go pay somebody 20% more than they're making now and steal them. Do you, do you know what? Um, I'll just drop in a quick one. Um, yeah, jobs in cyber is only 5% if anyone needs any spaces. Mm. For but this isn't about jobs in cyber. So <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that. What I want to go back to is an area I think a lot of SMBs are missing out on. So they're looking at security as a bit of a business blocker, perhaps at the moment, or a, an extra expense that they don't want to take on. I would argue that dependent upon industry and dependent upon the type of business, having a robust security program can become a huge sales enablement for your business. And it can also give you access to contracts that you just would not have had before. Yeah, for sure. So uh, was there a question in that? Sorry. I don't, I don't think there was. No, it was more It was more about, um, well, I suppose there is really, you know, how, how can small businesses change their perspective on engaging with cybersecurity? Because at the moment it's seen by the majority, I would say, as an ex extra expense. They haven't been breached. What's the problem? Yeah. You know, but from a from yeah. an education point of view, I think getting the point across to them how it can help them potentially get bigger contracts with bigger clients. So that was kind of the question on around that. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so if a small business, you know, wanted to do government contracting, there are compliance things they can meet to help, you know, get that or or help get, you know, bigger work. Um, but for uh, the small businesses to um you know just oftentimes can't like like we've mentioned you just can't afford to do all of that and then even if they knew 20 things they needed to do that's overwhelming yeah. so their perspective is oh this company says i need to do these 20 things and do this one monthly this one quarterly this one annually oh that's too much i'm you know they're focused on running their business and oftentimes even if they do know what to do it can be very overwhelming and pricing right now in cyber has gone up quite a lot, you know, because the, the, of the talent shortage has raised um, salaries, which has raised prices of products and services and so on and so forth. 
Um, so oftentimes, you know, small businesses, I Google a lot of statistics, so I'm not sure if these are accurate, but the, the last statistic I read on the number of cyber attacks that uh, target small businesses, now this is successful and non-successful attacks, all cyber attacks target 43% of small businesses. So I know yeah. in different countries and different industries, small business may mean different things, but, um, you know, in, a, in America, you know, some small businesses are considered less than 500 employees, some small businesses, you know, less than $30 million in revenue, you know, whatever the characteristic is. So almost half of cyber attacks target small businesses. And the majority of businesses in the United States are small businesses. There's not that many unicorns, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, these large enterprises with or Amazon with their million employees. You know, there's not that many of these companies, right? The majority of businesses are small businesses. And another statistic I read is that if a small business is attacked, 60% of the time they have to close their doors within six months because they didn't have the backups, you know, to, they didn't pay, you know, if they get ransomware, they didn't have money to pay or insurance to pay for the, to get the encryption key back, um, which is not recommended to pay it anyway. Um, you know, they didn't have air gap backups. So maybe if they had backups, they were encrypted as well. So essentially a business sometimes has to start over and oftentimes it's too much of a cost burden to do that. So oftentimes, you know, I, there was a business a couple of years ago at this time of year at Christmas time, somebody clicked the link, got ransomware. They had to close their doors. 300 people lost their job because of rent of ransomware attack. They couldn't afford to, they didn't have backups. They didn't have cybersecurity protection. And it was an older business and they just had to shut the doors, uh, which is, which is de devastating to 300 plus families. Right. Um, and aside from it being in the holiday season, um, losing your job at any time is, is terrible. Um, I think that the first stat you came out was interesting. Was it 43%? Because yeah, I think how think, many, yeah, cyber attacks affect small businesses or, Target and I, I think I think in a lot of small businesses' minds, they think, "Well, we're small; they're not going to attack us." When yeah. when we know in reality, the the people who are doing this have probably got no clue how big you are until they actually get a foothold wow. in something, and then they start digging. You know, it's a, it's a numbers game; it's spray and play until they oh, get yeah. a foothold, and then it's dig around. I mean, the the scariest thing at the moment is you hear that the threat actors are attacking insurance companies to yeah, get the databases sure. of the people who've got the insurance. Yeah. So are they then yeah. even know what ransomware payment to ask for, don't they? Yeah, that's that's targeted marketing for them, I guess. Yeah. In a way. So, yeah, if they can get insurance and insurance companies, oftentimes compliance is behind, you know, they'll they'll require a pen test. And then, you know, but it's been because pen tests have been needed for 10 or 15 years, you yeah. know, and then they'll catch, you know, multi-factors finally starting to make its way into cyber insurance questionnaires. You know, used to, you didn't, you just paid for cyber insurance. You didn't get asked questions. Now you're no. getting asked, you know, do you have SPF, DKIM and DMARC on your email? Do you have, you know, multi-factor on everything external facing? So if you have an internet connection, you are being attacked. So it's, it's just like Simon said, it is spray and, and play. They are running these automated scripts. They're not manually doing the initial piece and sending out millions and millions of spam emails, phishing emails to get you to click the link to allow them into your network. And then I don't haven't looked at the statistics lately. I know a couple of years ago, it was often three months, 90 to 93 days before, on average before an attacker has been identified in your network. So you look at companies like Uber have been attacked twice this year. You know, they have full cybersecurity teams. So how can a small business that can't even afford that protect themselves? You know, you really have to outsource your your protection. Um, you do, and it's, it's, it's engaging with your staff as well, isn't it? And having a company yeah. like Boots to Cyber to come in and actually be able to do some awareness training for them that's specific to the risks and attack methods that they're going to come across because while some of these you know click and forget kind of training plans are great i think it does need to be industry and business specific you know you think um i don't know my my eldest son who works as a business development consultant he sits in an office all day on a phone with email so he's going to have you know phishing attempts all this social engineering side all the other stuff that you worry about then you look at a friend of mine who's a mechanic who, let's be honest, the only thing he probably worries about when it comes to being hacked 
is the device they use for the cars. And you think these go, these get plugged in by USB or whatever it is into, into a computer to update the software. So again, it's a different threat, isn't it? It's different threats that people have to be aware of. And I want to go back to something you said um, with regards to stats and talk about tick boxes a little bit. So in, in the UK, we've got a base entry entry kind of standard called Cyber Essentials, which costs you next to nothing. It's about, I think it's just under a thousand pounds to do it as a business. It's a self-assessment and it's meant it's a government run thing to encourage businesses to, you know, take it seriously. Well, the stats as of three months ago were that one percent of the SMBs in the UK had even done that. Right. And I would say doing a tick box exercise, we all know how honest they can be, especially if you're trying to get your insurance premium down. <laughs> or is yeah. that just my cynical outlook? Self-assessments, you know, there's there's a lot of organizations um, like MITRE and SANS and um, CIS, you know, um, they provide a lot of these self-assessments and recommendations to do certain things. But if if you're the CEO of a small business and you know that industry, are you going to really understand all of those questions and what it's even talking about? Yeah. You know, if a, you know, medical, like I, I do not do well in hospitals and especially in ICU rooms. I've, uh, I faint a lot in those environments. So if a, if I had, if a doctor gave me a self-assessment, most of the stuff, I don't even know. I, you know, all that terminology there, business owners are not going to understand what all the terminology even means to, to, to make that self-assessment applicable. You know, it really, cause there's, there's a disconnect there. And yeah. even IT people, you know, like I did IT for years, I had no clue what all these vulnerabilities existed because I was so focused keeping the network running, keeping the you know disaster recovery site prepped, keeping the make sure backups were you know tapes were rotated, the the um, you know redundancy was everywhere on each network, setting up phone systems. So if you're studying all these things and doing all these certs and you're zoned in on that industry, you know. There, you don't have the resources or the time to go now study all the vulnerabilities. That's a completely different thing. And that's why, you know, people say, well, you need to have IT. You need to have help desk. Well, yes, it will help you be a better cybersecurity expert. However, to the person that finds the vulnerabilities on a Cisco router is not going to be the one to fix it. So why do they need three years experience of setting up routers <laughs> to find a vulnerability when they're never going to be the one to fix it? Great. That's going to get passed to someone else. So they need to learn how to find the issues and let the other someone else fix it. Engineer or remediate know it. how to fix it or replace yeah. it or put in a new one. You know, so yes, just like somebody that says certs are great or you have to have a cert and you have to have a degree, you have to have help desk, you have to have system administration or network engineering. Yes, all these things are great and will help you be a better expert. But if you don't have all that, you need a way to learn how to find the issues, how to okay. identify the issues and translate that to business risk to that CEO. So he understands, oh, I don't need to have my data in the cloud for everybody to see because that's data potential data loss, potential, you know, putting their client data, their credit card information out to the world or out to an attacker, you know, so now you're breaking your PCI compliance or you're putting your health data on a cloud environment in a public S3 bucket. And now attackers have your patient's health data, which is against HIPAA compliant, you know, so they really need to understand why they need to have encryption on their cloud data. They need to have it encrypted when it's being sent or transmitted or received. They need to have multi-factor authentication on that. There needs to be reviews on who has access to the data. So there's a ton of, but but they don't understand when you ask, do you have multi-factor authentication and encryption on your cloud S3 buckets? Like, I don't hmm. know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're but, talking about. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's. But you, you, you're, you're right. And that, and that is half the problem. And I'll just come back to the chat quickly because Jay Tilson's in the chat 
who um, is like yourself, an industry veteran and, and also an all round amazing guy. I met him at Black Hat for the first time last week and he's got a podcast as well. And I'm all about sharing best ideas and practice. So this isn't about all about InfoSec Live. It's also about Boots to Cyber and anyone else out there who's adding value. And Jay Tilson's podcast, SSE Forum, I'm going to drop the link to the website in here now. And apparently you talked about certs and training with Jim Tiller on a podcast today that's going to be released soon. So anyone who's going back to the breaking in, looking for exams, to, you know, certs, training, what do I do? I think the more you can listen to experts like Patrick and Jay, the better. So thanks, Jay, for, for dropping that in. And apologies for, for interrupting you there, Patrick. Hey, no worries. Yeah, and, and another thing too, yeah, find places like that SSC forum or um, places that want to help you because boot camps say they'll give you a job or university will say they'll give you a job if you spend two hundred thousand dollars in four years with them and then you end up getting a sock you know might get a sock job you know barely making enough to pay your student loan debt so yeah. just be careful with these promises it's, it's, that it's, man, it's managing managing your own expectations isn't it yeah. and i whilst i didn't fall foul of a boot camp I fell foul of my own personality type, which is one that wants to run before it can walk. And I think, yeah, you know, we, 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 well. talk, we, we talk a lot about the issues with hiring practices, but what we don't talk about enough is the brutal honesty that sometimes the managing expectations from the candidates from my side, our side of you is, is not quite right. And I think we can attribute a bit of blame to that, to the narrative that you see on social media, especially around, you know, some boot camps and don't pay now, pay later and you'll get this amazing job. When in, when in reality, wow. you can't do, in my opinion, you can't do a six month boot camp and become an expert. You can do a six month boot camp and land a job in the industry. Of course you can, because you don't have to be an expert to land that job. But I'd also argue you could do that without paying out your transition budget or, you know, money that you've got in the bank or your parents' money to do that. And I think wow. what Paul Cummings at Whole Cyber Human Initiative's been doing, what Peter Klein at Boots to Books, what you're doing at, at, at Boots to Cyber, we're all trying to bring that awareness, I think, out because that there are exams you have to pay for. Of course there are, you know, and there's exams wow. that are worth having. But unless you can have a deep under, or an understanding of, of the whole industry and where it slots into that. So for me, it was, I want to be a pen tester, I'm going to, fail OSCP miserably, I didn't really have any idea how what I'd learned fitted in to the overall landscape. And I think I think that's yeah. that's a bit of honesty from my point of view. I think it does it does take time. That is possible. I'm not being a gatekeeper here. I just think we need to manage our own expectations a little bit as well. Right. Cause even with I can list out all the crazy certs, bunch of letters, all that mess, bachelor's degree, master's degree, military experience. 90% of what I've learned in 18 years has been on the job training. It's yeah. doing the work until you do it every day. And it's, it is hard if, if you're, you know, going to school or you're working in a different industry and wanting to break into cyber and you have a family and you have a lot of side responsibilities, you can't dedicate eight hours a day of learning. The best way to do that is get a, you know, paid internship, paid apprenticeship program, something, you know, even if it's entry level, job to where you're doing it day in day out um so you know that's again that's kind of where the gaps we're wanting to fill the, the problems the problems are is the, the talent shortage which you know which is whole cyber paul and um and i are trying to to help resolve with whole cyber plus with boost to cyber um you know boost to books with peter klein and the team there is outstanding you know they provide a ton of free training free books if you're going to school free uh, certification vouchers, you know, definitely, definitely reach out to them. Um, drop, there are a lot drop of link, I'll drop some links in while yeah. you're saying this. So the first one's whole cyber. I'm then going to yeah. grab boots to books and boots to cyber yeah, as boots well. To books too. Yeah. So, so there are great resources. Um, but again, you know, don't, don't give up. It does take time, but that's where the net, like, like we mentioned at the beginning, the networking is going to be your, your shortest path. And, and it's, it's not a shortcut. It's again, all that's all about marketing yourself, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, even posting on LinkedIn about, hey, I did this lab today and hack the box or snap labs. And I, I learned today, I learned this. If you're posting that once a day, you're learning something every day. 
you're you're posting about it, you may not get any clicks. Yeah, you, you're mentioning you're mentioning something there, Patrick, that not everyone yeah. does. You see, and I don't want to excuse my French or my English. I don't want to piss on anyone's parade here, but saying that you're top two percent in try hack me, or saying that you've just passed a certification, whilst that's amazing. It isn't telling anyone what you've learned and how you can apply that to a job. Right. Yeah. If you do a walkthrough on LinkedIn, you know, I've seen, I've hired um, an army vet in the last three, four months that he was doing um, a post a day on a new tool. Um, another, uh, a Marine vet I'm mentoring right now, he's posting hundred days of cyber, you know, tips throughout this year. So, um, yeah. So it, it takes effort to do those things, but that really puts you out there and that'll stick in the minds of hiring managers that are seeing your posts. So as you build your network, the more people are going to see these posts. And when they have a job opening available, I'm going to reach out to this guy and say, hey, would you be interested in interviewing for this? I've been seeing you post for three months each day on what you're learning, you know, because that shows, you know, if you say, oh, I'm top one percent. And you've never had a pen test job, you know, I'm going to ask you a lot harder questions, yeah. you know, because you're, you're posting just your strengths out there instead of areas of improvement, you know, because yeah. that's really where a hiring manager needs to see. It's not that to make you look bad it's to see where they can help you grow. Um, so do we well, have, that's, 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 that's what they're meant to be doing, Patrick. Oh well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's a that's a whole nother show um we've got we've got five minutes left i hope you don't mind i'm gonna if you get bombarded you'll have to kick me under the table later but i'm gonna drop your linkedin profile link in the chat as yeah well. no worries yeah reach out message um like i said we can i'll help you in any way i can and then like i said we're booster cyber is a very much a brand new startup so we are again planet you know we haven't we've made one post i think on linkedin but yeah here soon we'll start posting more um, really getting awareness for what we're trying to do, you know, I mean, for the military community, but for, for small businesses, schools, um, you know, universities, hospitals, uh, anywhere that we can, we can help, especially in areas that don't, don't have as much, you know, regulation and compliance areas. What, what about, what about people who want to get involved with Boots to Cyber from a potential employment or a helping out point of view? Are you looking for help at the moment? Are you looking to take people on? Uh, as we grow, like you would definitely need to get revenue coming in first to be able to take people on. Um, yeah. yeah, if people want to do, I mean, the one thing I can offer right now is, you know, we're offering a whole cyber program, you know, through what Paul's done over there to go through for training. But yeah, if, I mean, if people want to volunteer for unpaid apprenticeship or unpaid internship, yeah, we definitely have stuff that you could help work on to help learn. It would benefit us, you, and build that relationship. Um, a lot, but I'd love to eventually have a paid apprenticeship, essentially that, you know, people are going alongside the more senior people as they're learning and then, but, and then be able to train the next rotation. You know, well, if, if, it, if it encourages anyone, um, for those yeah. that know me, you'll know that I'm not a cyber expert and, and my kind of skill set lays in, I suppose, relationship marketing and sales more than it does cyber. And I'm very much looking forward to giving up some of my time to Patrick and the team to help them, you know, get a bit of clarity around that route to market. And I'm, I'm st during this stream, I've written down four ideas that I didn't have when we spoke a week ago. So I'm looking forward to, and I am genuinely excited. I think it's a space that's hugely neglected, you know, the SMB place and to be bringing people in from military backgrounds as well is just phenomenal, Patrick. So I absolutely applaud you for what you're doing. I really do. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. And there's, I don't remember, there was something else, but I've, Lost train of thought. No worries. Um, yes. Do, do, we have, yeah. do we have any other questions before we before we need to go? That, let me let me have a look. I have a, I think we've covered them all off, but let me have a quick check. Um, Paul from Whole Cyber mentioned earlier that there is a free cert. I think that they've got on their website at the moment. So if you want to find out more about that, do jump on the Whole Cyber Human Initiative website. I have um I have dropped the link in the chat. So just scroll back through. And again, I've put links in the chat for. Boots to Books, Peter Klein's organization, Boots to Cyber, and also Patrick's and my own LinkedIn profiles as well. And on the show last week with Jessica Boyer, I did offer out to people that if they wanted to book, you know, if, if they're struggling, they need some motivation and they wanted to book in a, a 30 minute chat with myself over the next week or two, I'm going to drop a link in now for that 
for you to be able to book that. However, um, I will say that it will only be live for probably 45 minutes before I pull it. So I don't get my diary too jammed up before Christmas. But if there is anyone who wants to chat, needs some motivation, or the, the one thing I can help you with is probably connecting with people. So Patrick's talked a lot today about the importance of networking. Um, I've got a pretty big network, as Patrick has as well. So if there's anyone in particular you'd like to be introduced to or you want to know how to get in touch with people, reach out to myself, and I'm sure, Patrick, you'd be happy to help people with that as well. And, Paul, thank you. It's the, the MSI Business Management Essential Certification, which is free right now. So, yeah, please, please, please do go and check that out. Any wise words to finish off with, Patrick, before we wrap up and I dream about KFC in two hours' time? Do you prefer crispy or original? crispy all the way yeah. uh, original original <laughs> you? Oh, you see i'm not i'm not where, where he works it's not the best kfc i mean i don't know uh, what the franchise is like in the u.s but it's probably yeah. the worst run the worst run fast food outlet in the uk kfc and good, it's not yeah. just because my 17 year old works there it's quite well, a you're a long out. way from kentucky you know that is very true I'm very it's close to problem. Kentucky, so. You've got proper Kentucky fried chicken. I'll take a picture of it later and send it across, and you can tell me yeah. how poor it is. <laughs> I did have one more thing. Actually, I remember what I was going to ask you. So I actually could use help or some advice, Simon, from you or if anybody has something. So we, so you asked if we have a way for people to sign up. So yes. I've actually been testing several WordPress job plugins or job boards. So we're having a hard time finding a, and I guess maybe the solution is an applicant tracking system where we can have people register, say what they're interested in, upload a resume, but then us be able to search keywords that search the resume. Oftentimes, all the I've ones I've tested, thing. you can't search inside the PDF no. or the doc, Word doc, which makes it a very manual process to find the information. Do you do you use um, any kind of CRM system at the moment? Uh, that's a funny, we just canceled, one, we've tested three, we're about to test our fourth one. What, so, ones have you, what ones have you tested? Uh, we started with Yeti Force, an actual, actually a UK one, but they didn't have much support there. We built that one because it was free. Um, yeah. We've tested uh, mo mostly. We've tested Method CRM, uh, yeah. but we're we're right now in talks with Monday Monday yeah. CRM. You know, for like work management. So they may have a form based thing, like like we use Office three sixty five. Well, I know I know for a fact yeah. that Monday does have a form based thing that can do that. Oh, okay. because the firm I was working with before. Mm -hmm. use monday for lots of things and i think if you okay. use it properly it's fantastic and also quite cost effective and i'm mm -hmm. definitely not on commission for these people <laughs> i'm using for my own hubspot and i've got two points of view on that one it's the slickest easiest to use quickest system for everything but my god do they get you on the charges <laughs> so you get i think a few months at a discounted rate and as soon as you start layering on that tech stack you know the different yeah. things in there you're talking like a fair few hundred every month for that CRM. Oh, yeah. so if All anyone else has got any years. CRM suggestions, I think um, Sweet CRM hmm. is that by that's uh, open source. I, I, open it sounds source. familiar. I haven't yeah, really sweet, looked into that. Sweet CRM is open source, and there's another one called Zoho, which hmm. is which does lots of different things, which is also pretty cheap and cost effective. It's yeah. actually recommended to me by a CISO last year when I was looking at setting up a business. But I'll catch up with you um, yeah, after after, after the holiday period and, and we can we can talk through all these things. But just to just to finish off, I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Patrick, for giving up the thank time you. to know. Thank you, sir. And to everyone in the chat again, you really are what make these events interactive and insightful and engaging because I can't talk to people and ask questions. I can't do two things at once. So I rely on all of you in, in the audience to come on. and I would, do. I would listen to that talk, Simon. If you're yeah. on both sides, I could, I would do it. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much. Jay Tilson, Kerry, Liam, Rebecca, Paul, all of you. Thank you so, so much. And if I don't see you before, well, actually back in the studio tomorrow for the CISO experience back on Friday for, um, again, more about hiring in cybersecurity. And next week, the, the holiday week, somehow we've got five live streams. We've got one a day um, next week. So that should be super exciting. So you'll see me next Friday looking absolutely exhausted before Christmas and looking forward to a well-deserved break. Patrick, everyone, it's been a pleasure. See you soon. Have a good day.